This is Ashley Masterich on October 7th, 2013 at UT Jesse H. Jones Communication Center with Gonzalo Barrientos. The project is entitled The Voting Rights Oral History Project, which is in conjunction with the Voices Oral History Project. So thank you, Gonzalo, for joining me today to talk to me about this um, fascinating topic in history. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, let's just start with some basic questions. Your family background, you were born on July 20th, 1941 where at city did you spend the majority of your childhood uh in texas okay i was born in galveston i have to go back a little bit just so you can get a full picture okay uh, my family is uh, originally from Bast bastrop texas which is 30 miles outside of boston uh, my grandpa and my dad my uncles were coal miners north of bastrop about four miles are coal mines uh, in the early 40s, approximately, uh, the coal mines closed because it was subbituminous coal, uh, soft coal, okay. not uh, as hot burning as the anthracite coal from uh, the Northeast. At any rate, uh, that was about the time my mom and dad got married. And when they closed the coal mines down, they moved to Galveston. My dad was a longshoreman in Galveston. I was born there. After a year or so, uh, my dad uh, was hurt on the ships, and so they came back to the little farm in Bastrop. After that, uh, uh, I grew up basically uh, the migrant trail, farm workers picking cotton in uh, Central Texas, uh, South Texas, and West Texas, places like uh, in South Texas, Mathis, Sinton, okay. and then no, uh, Northwest toward uh, Paducah, Littlefield, uh, Monday, uh, Tahoka, Lubbock, etc. Mm -hmm. Came back to uh, Bastrop every year, especially when we first started school, my sister and I. Okay, and it was just your sister and you were the only siblings from your mother and father? Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. and what were your mother and father's names? My father's name was Gonzalo Barrientos. He was senior and I was junior. junior. And uh, my mother's name was Cristina and my sister was Alicia. Okay. Describe a typical day um, with your family, your mother, your father, and your sister. At what point in time? <laughs> um, let's just say when you were maybe eight to ten years old when you were younger. Any significant memories that you have with them or a certain day you enjoyed? I, I think it would be interesting uh, for you to, for me to go back to when I was six. Okay. The first uh, year of public uh, schools. Mm. Uh, Mom and Dad were uh, only had uh, one or two grades of education, uh, basically in Spanish, and uh, but they thought that it, education was the most important. So, when came time for me to go to school, uh, there were three schools in Bastrop: one for blacks, one for whites, and one for Mexicans. A little girl named Minerva Delgado. Uh, was I think in the second or third grade. A civil rights lawyer from San Antonio took the case uh, on segregation of Mexican Americans to court and along with several other lawyers uh, won the case and that set the stage for desegregation of Mexican Americans in the whole state not just in Bastrop. Okay. Um, what year was that? Do you you could guess. Oh, I don't know, close to 1950s. Okay. Um, so at that time, uh, you'd go to school, they give you a piece of paper and a crayon, and that was all. So the first year, I went to the Mexican school. By the second year, because of the desegregation, I was going to school with white kids. Um, you go to school, and it was interesting because uh, sometimes I'd come home crying. My grandfather would say, "Que pasó, mijo?" I said, "Well, uh, the white kids, uh, I don't think they like me." And he would say, "No los culpes a ellos, sino al corral donde se criaron." Do not blame them; rather, blame the corral in which they grew up. And that basically set up the the whole framework for the rest of my life. Uh, uh, living that and having gone through some uh, situations uh, going out to West Texas 
uh, we could not use the bathrooms. We had to stop and uh, the uh, uh, rest areas were culverts underneath the highway, if you get my drift. Mm -hmm. um, I think we invented fast food because we couldn't eat in the cafes or restaurants. We'd uh, order around the back hamburgers to go, so fast food is the way we did it until we got to the location where we were going to pick cotton. So it just depends a typical day with my parents on at what point in time and where. Okay. Um, I guess just you mentioned how, you know, desegregation of schools. So this was typical for all Mexican-American children in Texas. This was not just a single um, experience for yourself. You felt like this was um, a normal, like the life of a normal Mexican-American child, correct? Yes and no. There were certain areas of Texas during that time where the majority of uh, citizens were Mexican-Americans. For example, uh, from Brownsville to Laredo, the border areas. And so basically there, I don't believe there was much segregation. But once you got away from the border, uh, all the way up to Abilene or uh, East Texas, there was segregation. Okay. Um, during your adolescence, so maybe middle school, high school, when you're starting to realize more things and see the differences between um, different people, what was your vision for the future regarding Mexican-American rights? A multifaceted uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, one had to go through competition at work, at, at, at school. Um, and it was always from my mother and father, study, study, study. Uh, if you're getting beat down or bullied, uh, uh, my mother's favorite saying was, no te dejes, do not allow it, do not permit it. Um, so there was competition all the time, and I, I think that in a way helped uh, make me stronger. Um, I took the tr up the trumpet, played the trumpet in the band. Uh, I played baseball, lettered in baseball, lettered in track, lettered in uh, football, 130-pound linebacker. <laughs> Bastrop Bears. Uh, competition. I can do it, I can do it. My mother and father would say, you can do it, you can do it, and other people. Um, so it was that way uh, all the time growing up. Um, and we accomplished a few things because of that push that was always uh, against some of us. Were there certain roles and occupations that Mexican Americans were expected to fill during? Um, <laughs> sure, picking cotton, chopping cotton, uh, washing cars, um, digging ditches. So manual uh, labor. Ah. Okay. Um, you were able, though, to attend uh, the University of Texas at Austin, where you got um, a BA in uh, psychology and Spanish. Why those two subjects? Well, first of all, <coughs> let me be very clear. Um, in the last junior year of high school, uh, I didn't want to go pick cotton anymore because that was my whole life, every, every uh, season for farming. And uh, so I had some cousins in Galveston still, and they said, get out of the 100 degree weather and sweating and being dirty, come to Galveston and we'll get you a job as a busboy. So my uh, junior year in high school, I was a busboy and a waiter in Galveston, the hotels, the large hotels over there. And I met a young lady whose name was Emma. And uh, uh, long story short, she was 17, I was barely 18, we got married. And I came to the University of Texas, and she went to work, and uh, we kind of grew up together. So uh, at the University of Texas, uh, I, I worked full time most of the time, flipped hamburgers at the Holiday House, which is right across the street from uh, the uh, Austin uh, Catholic Church um, uh, there on uh, Guadalupe. And uh, I had first wanted to start off uh, 
getting a major in hotel and restaurant management. And then I thought of all the things that uh, I and my family uh, and other uh, Tejanos had, had been through. And I said, I want to go into something a little more useful, which was sociology, psychology, et cetera. By my junior year, um, we had three children. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to work. Uh, my wife uh, had uh, been working all of the time. And uh, so I never got the degree, but I, I got a pretty good education. Okay. Uh, would you say then, what was your bi biggest obstacle that you faced during the time where you were trying to study, have a family, raise <laughs> children, and still manage to make an income for yourself and your wife and your kids? The biggest obstacle yeah. was uh, trying to work full time and uh, trying to study and make the grades. Um, the University of Texas, if you, if you come from a school where your graduating class was 27 people and you come to the University of Texas, one of my first classes was in geology with two or three hundred students in there, which uh, kind of blows you away. Uh, getting into the, the, uh, the scene, if you will, over here, the methodology uh, in working, uh, taking care of the babies and all that stuff. Okay. Who were your, um, I guess, who or what were your inspirations or role models during this time um, in your collegiate years and in your young adulthood? Oh, a, a number of people. I had uh, at one time uh, listened uh, intently to John Kennedy and uh, he had something that, that really inspired uh, about serving your country. Um, I met Lyndon Johnson <laughs> when I was playing in the high school band in, in Bastrop. Uh, but at, at during those years, uh, it was the civil rights years, and of course, it made me think back on Benito Juarez, who was president of Mexico, and Emiliano Zapata, uh, Villa, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, I met Jesse Jackson, uh, who later uh, worked on a few things together. Um, women, you always remember your mom and uh, your aunts uh, to begin with. Um, in later years, there were other uh, women who had uh, inspired me also. Okay. So did these people kind of help lead you into where you wanted to run for office and um, kind of pursue that aspect of your life, or were they just overall influences to make you a well-rounded person? Absolutely had an influence, but also the day-to-day -day, uh, workings led me there. I had uh, been a ed psych research assistant at the university. I had... Uh, worked as what they called a ward attendant at that time at Travis State School, where uh, at that time the terminology was used, retarded children, uh, developmentally, mentally disabilities. Um, so that taught me a lot also, seeing individuals like that. Uh, later worked as a community organizer under uh, John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson's uh, War on Poverty. I was a community organizer for the National Urban League. Mm -hmm. uh, I was later a trainer for the Step Peace Corps. Uh, I was later a uh, uh, program officer for the federal government, uh, placing uh, the Domestic Peace Corps VISTA volunteers all over the state of Texas. Uh, all in the meantime, I wish I had a nickel for every march I was in. Uh, civil rights, farm workers, the uh, war against uh, on, in Vietnam, uh, I had a, I went to Washington and worked one year in Washington for the Institute uh, for Community Development. Came back and uh, what, what led me into politics was interesting. Upon coming back, we were organizing groups of uh, Tejanos, uh, we called ourselves Chicanos at that point. Uh, so that term also is interesting because we went everywhere from on the, on the very negative side from being called Mexicans, greasers, uh, taco eaters, etc., to uh, 
uh, Latin Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, Hispanic. So we called ourselves Chicanos at the time that we gave ourselves that name. Um, at any rate, we were starting th these groups, and uh, one evening over at the Austin uh, uh, Salvation Army uh, Center, which was on uh, about Holly and I-35, um, we were talking about the problems that uh, the community had. And so we went around the room and said, well, you solved those issues in the legislature. Oh, okay. Have to be a House member or a senator. So we went around the room and we said, how about you? And somebody would say, oh, I don't speak well. How about you? Uh, I have too many children. How about you? I work at night. And finally I said, well, I'll do it. So I ran uh, for office the uh, first time in 1972 after I came back from Washington. Okay. Let's backtrack a little. You mentioned uh, your work with the National Urban League and with Vista and Peace Corps. Can you give me uh, a t like a chronological dates for those? Let's see. Uh, community organizer for the National Urban League and Project Enable in 1965. Okay. Um, trainer for Vista Peace Corps, 66 to Mm, 67, 68, a federal employee for VISTA, uh, about 68 to 70, 71. And then in Washington from 71 to 72. And then you came back to Texas in 72 and you were then um, elected into office in 1975 for the uh, Texas um, House of Representatives, <coughs> correct? In 72, uh, we ran for one of the four uh, House of Representative positions in Travis County. We did not have single member districts, had to run the whole county. And they told us that uh, we were foolish because we only had 10% uh, Mexican American population. And I uh, kind of laughed it off and said, well, I speak English. I uh, would hope that would be uh, uh, sufficient to communicate. Uh, we got into a runoff uh, against a 14-year incumbent and uh, learned a great deal. Uh, politics is not just about running for office and they vote for you or not. There's a lot in between that you have to do. Got into a runoff. Uh, the uh, uh, opponent had more money coming in from the lobby and so uh, we lost 42 to 43,000. 74, came back and ran again, got into another runoff and uh, with the same fellow. And this time we won by 84 votes. The opponent calls for a recount, we gain 10 votes and we win by 94 votes. So the first time it was uh, the Heartbreak Kid, the second time it was Landslide Barrientos by 94 votes. And we uh, served 10 years in the Texas House. Tell me a little bit about your responsibilities when you were serving those 10 years in the House. Well, the, f <laughs> the first thing that people, most people don't uh, realize is that there is a learning process unless you have been uh, working there as an employee or uh, assistant to one of the members for years. Uh, you have to know what's what, you have to know the rules, you have to know the unwritten rules um, and uh, you have to vote on laws and what I consider very very important is doing constituent work every day people who come in and say uh, can you help find my daughter a scholarship uh, I just got fired from a state agency uh, my our uncle is in prison can you get him out on parole? Uh, you name it, they call and they come and you try to help. Uh, the voting is easy. You just say I or nay. And uh, uh, most of the time it's easy to come to a conclusion on which way you should vote. 
What was your biggest, or were you ever frustrated with this learning curve when you first entered into office? Did you ever feel at times that this wasn't for <coughs> you anymore? Did you ever question yourself? <laughs> the only question I had was making $600 a month, which is all they pay. Uh, and so I had to hustle to, to on other jobs to uh, uh, make a living for the kids and uh, our family. Um, no, I never questioned it because uh, it was the right thing to do. And uh, at, at first, one thinks, at least I, that you go up to the front mic and give a heck of a speech and pass a law. It didn't work like that at all. There are committees. There are rules. You have to get along on each little step. It's very difficult to pass a law. It's very easy to destroy and uh, uh, crash with something you're trying to carry. Uh, were there any major legislation or bills that you were uh, particularly keen on during your time in the House? Or those mostly in when you served in the Senate from 1985 to 2000? No, there were some important uh, things going on. Uh, I was fortunate in having uh, landed uh, an appropriations committee position. So that was very important in terms of uh, putting out the money for schools, uh, education, transportation, uh, dealing with the uh, less fortunate, the poor. Uh, so that was important. There were other areas uh, that we were uh, working on. I remember one a specific area that I passed a bill on. Uh, it had to do with a child who was taken to a West Texas hospital, a city in West Texas. And they asked the, the parents if they had insurance, and they said no, so they couldn't take the child. They drove 30 or 40 miles to another little town, and the child died uh, as they were carrying him in. So I. Uh, developed a bill that said uh, y if under uh, life-threatening situations you will be treated regardless of anything and deal with uh, money later or insurance, what have you. We're still dealing with that problem today. Um, there were other uh, laws that we were taking on, but that was one of the main ones that I carried. So you, um, when you were in office, your particular area that you kind of advanced the right for Mexican Americans, you worked with the underprivileged and you kind of advocated for those less fortunate. Um, did you mostly focus, I guess which area did you mostly focus on in particular? This area and getting elected in this area is unique. Um, I may still have been today the only one minority elected by a majority white district. It was incumbent upon me that I show my constituents that I would represent people, citizens, regardless of what color, whether they were white, black, Hispanic, Asian, or what have you, in an equal manner. Uh, of course, at the same time, I was still advocating for the rights of uh, uh, Mexican Americans, but that included anyone who was in the area of not getting a good education, uh, adequate jobs, uh, non-discrimination in all of these areas. Okay. Um, <laughs> I am reminded uh, later, a very good friend of mine, Senator Elliot Shapley from El Paso, uh, Anglo spoke fantastic Spanish, elected by a majority uh, Hispanic district. And I, over here, uh, a Mexican-American, elected by a majority white district. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that was uh, the American way, if you will. Very nice. Um, let's move on to your time in the Senate. And just <coughs> wanna, like we- Time out. All right. So um, just to backtrack a little bit, who were those um, people that were attending the Salvation Army meeting that one night when y'all were going around the room talking about these issues that were you were affected by? That was uh, several decades ago. <laughs> so uh, I can only tell you that 
it were some of the um, activists in the community, uh, primarily from the east and south side, uh, Mexican-American, of course, uh, people like uh, John Trevino, who was a neighborhood center director, um, uh, probably Rudy Reyes from Montopolis, uh, neighborhood center director, uh, probably Richard Moya, who was later an investigator for legal aid, uh, people like that. Okay. And then fast forward uh, to right where we left off, uh, your responsibilities moving on to when you were in the Texas uh, State Senate from 1985 to 2007. Kind of what were the main differences between your time in um, the House of Representatives and then your time in the Senate? Well, after 10 years in the House, I uh, ran for the Senate. A uh, very difficult race, had uh, two counties, Hayes County and uh, Travis County. Uh, got in a runoff and, and won. Um, by this time, we had learned quite a bit about campaigning and how to do it and raising a little money. Interestingly, a little sidebar, uh, when I was running for the, the House and then later the Senate, uh, people were wondering where we got our startup money. And uh, interestingly, uh, a compadre of mine owned a, uh, a ballroom, a dance hall. And it was called, uh, well, there were several. There were the, the Latin Quarter, uh, there was uh, uh, Whiskey River, there was uh, El Chaparral. And uh, we had friends who were uh, musicians, people like the Ramos brothers, the, the Mexican, uh, the Texas Revolution, Alfonso Ramos, Ruben Ramos, uh, Little Joe, uh, Salaman, uh, Shorty Ortiz, etc. And so they would pay, play at a reduced price, and my compadre would give the ballroom to us. So we did dances in baile, and we would raise uh, maybe uh, 500, 1,000, 2,000 dollars a whack. And the opposition was always saying, where's he getting all that money? <laughs> it was from the people and dances primarily. Uh, but uh, at any rate, we won uh, for the Senate. Um, uh, night and day, the Senate and the Texas House. Texas House is 150 state representatives, and the Texas Senate is 31. Uh, more of a gentleman and gentle ladies uh, area of uh, legislative process. Uh, but not always. There were a few uh, fights, uh, if you will. Uh, you still have the process and learning the rules and whatnot, but uh, uh, I enjoyed it much more. Was the learning curve easier for you when you transitioned from the House to the Senate since you already had some experience in office, or was it different learning tasks? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, very similar. Uh, uh, so that it, you learn that over the years and uh, what to do how to uh, pass legislation, how to block legislation. So enjoyed it uh, quite a bit more. Pass more legislation. Who were your read people in your campaigns? My For what? Your read people, or the people that you went to, or you worked alongside with in the, your campaigns for the um, House and Senate. We developed our own as we went along. Um, we had to, to uh, save money, stretch the dollar. For example, we learned how to silk screen and print our own signs by the thousands. Uh, we had to uh, learn how to build the four by eight uh, signs and where to put them and all of these things. At the same time, we uh, went to a political uh, consultant who was just getting started, Peck Young, uh, for one he, very uh, well-known person here in Austin for your your block door-to-door uh, -door kind of campaigns and, and targeting and whatnot. Also was fortunate to uh, run into a fellow named Dean Rindy who uh, did the media and uh, did a good job of that. So we became pretty polished fairly quickly in the methodology.
Okay. Okay, um, do you mind, maybe you mentioned just a second ago um, how you said the Senate, it was more civil, uh, gentleman-like, uh, lady-like. Could you kind of give maybe an um, example of that terminology or, you know, how would you describe that? Well, first of all, the, the uh, process of, of debating a bill. Uh, in the House, you have the front microphone where you present uh, your legislation. And there, the only debate there is is the back microphone where it's to ask questions to the author of the bill. Uh, otherwise, it all takes place in committees. In the Senate, each desk has their own microphone or if you're loud enough, you can do it without the microphones. And the language used is a little more formal. Uh, will the gentle lady from uh, uh, Blanco, Texas yield for a question? Will the senator from the great city of Dallas uh, uh, partake of a few moments of silence? Um, those were some of the differences. Now, in the Senate, you can't get anything up there to debate unless you already have uh, the votes to pass it. So that saves a lot of time. And you do most of your work in committee and, and trying to get your legislation uh, prepared. Okay. Great. Uh, we have a president of the Senate, which is typically the uh, lieutenant governor of the state of Texas, which is, uh, who is elected statewide. But the Senate can reject the lieutenant governor by saying you shall or you shall not be the president of the Senate. But generally, it's the lieutenant governor who uh, operates the uh, Senate process and the selection of senators to which committees. Um, and I don't know I've, if you said this again, do you mind repeating what committee were you primarily in in the Senate? I learned early on you go into the House and the Senate, or the, at least the House, and you want to do everything. You want to introduce 55 bills. You want to work on this, on this, on this, on this, on this. But I learned that if you're really serious of passing some legislation, you prioritize and you take three or four bills and you work your heart out for those. Um, but I also learned in trying to help uh, the needy, the less fortunate, equal rights for women, uh, minorities, that a lot of that depended on money. And where's the money? In the House, it's the Appropriations Committee. In the Senate, it's the Finance Committee. So I concentrated on the money. Uh, I was on numerous other committees, uh, Intergovernmental Affairs, um, uh, the nominations committee, I was chairman of the nominations committee. Whenever the governor appoints somebody, they got to come through us. We say yes or no to the governor. And sometimes I said no. Okay, you do, you've been in office uh, for many years, or you were in office for many years, and you describe all your roles and responsibilities. How did you ever um, avoid being burnt out in a sense? You do get quite frustrated sometimes, especially in the later years. Uh, when more Republicans were being elected. And the, uh, uh, they're putting down your priorities as low priorities. Um, but you have to remember, you're not up there for uh, your own glorification. Um, you're there because you're representing uh, people in your district and the people of Texas. and. So you just keep going. Um, but after being there for 21 years, uh, and it, it was always kind of a struggle. Uh, if you're wealthy or if you've got a big business or even if you're uh, an attorney, uh, you can do that on the side. But uh, otherwise, the other members, they have to work and uh, try to do that at the same time. Because I was from Austin, 
uh, I was on call all of the time. Uh, I'm still from Austin and I'm still on call by uh, 20 or 30 people a week who still keep calling me. Uh, but I don't have 10 employees anymore, that's what I tell them. Um, at any rate, after 20, about 21 years in the Senate, I uh, decided uh, it was time to uh, pay more attention to the family, uh, which was growing, and grandchildren. And uh, unfortunately, uh, three and a half years ago, my wife passed very suddenly. And so, uh, we didn't get to do everything we wanted. Do you think, though, it was it was it was the right time for you to kind of walk away from your um, time in the Senate at the very end, or would you have liked to expanded your time there? Years uh, before, uh, uh, Congressman Jake Pickle had called me and said he was going to retire. He was the congressman from Austin, and uh, I had thought about running. But uh, as it all turned out, um, uh, I did not run for several reasons. And uh, here we are in 2013, and I don't think I would want to be part of 435 people in the Texas, in the Washington House of Representatives who uh, think it's, uh, at least the Republicans think it's more important to play games and uh, than to compromise and uh, think of the people that they represent. What was your hardest thing you had to, or what was your biggest struggle um, while serving in the House or the Senate, or both, if you could think? Was it the struggle between the Democrats and the Republicans, and how, you know, there's always instances of bickering or disagreement? Um, that, that absolutely, in the later years, was uh, difficult. The uh, the disagreements between uh, the Democrats and the, the Republicans. Uh, although I, I passed a couple of bills where the Republicans were whole hog for it. Uh, number one, or, or an example, uh, the the uh, affirmative action had been uh, nixed by the the courts, and being in Austin, I got. Uh, a number of calls from around the state. What what are we going to do about uh, about Hispanics and uh, African Americans? And so, I called a summit uh, first at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and then later another one at uh, the AFL CIO, and brought in uh, activists from around Texas, lawyers, uh, scholars, uh, professors, and uh, a professor who was here for a while, David Montejano. Uh, and some of his colleagues suggested something, and so I introduced and passed uh, the top 10 percent rule, where all the students of Texas, regardless of whether you go to a large school in Houston or Dallas or in, um, in Poteet, Texas, if you're in the top 10 percent, you're automatically admitted to uh, colleges and universities. And uh, that, that had nothing to do with race. It was race neutral, and so we passed it. Now, uh, ever since then, I get the distinct feeling that the University of Texas doesn't like it. Too bad. Just elaborate, I guess, on why do you think they don't like it? Uh, I think large institutions want to do what they want to do. And uh, they don't like, in some cases, being told by the legislature you will do this or you will do that. Uh, and there were efforts by the University of Texas primarily to uh, uh, lower that percentage, the top 10 percent. Uh, I guess you'd have to ask uh, the president of the university and uh, so forth. Okay. Um, so moving away, we've talked By the way, yes. I went to UT. My son uh, went to UT. My daughter went to Texas A&M. So, uh, even now, I got grandkids who go to UT and A&M, so hook them and gig them. Right, you're on. not opposed to UT, <laughs> so that's good. Um, we're gonna. I've talked to, about your background and kind of your professional and political involvement. Um, we're gonna switch kind of to the Voting Rights Act. So my uh, one of my first questions for that is, how have you personally been affected by the Voting Rights Act? Well, as I've mentioned, uh, my whole life had to do with. Uh, uh, 
fighting uh, for, for um, equal rights, equal treatment. Uh, nothing more, nothing less, just being treated the same as any American. And uh, for the groups that I've primarily tried to assist, the poor, minorities, women, um, the mentally disabled, um, disabilities. And so I lost my train of thought. What was the last, the last part of the question? How have you been affected by the oh, Voting Rights Act? Well, yes, sir. Because of living all of that for so many years uh, and thinking back on the, the marches and why we were marching and uh, the Voting Rights Act came about and I think that I and people who were uh, working at the same time uh, like Senator Joe Bernal from San Antonio, Representative Ben Reyes from uh, Houston, uh, Representative Paul Moreno from uh, El Paso, all these uh, the men and women, uh, we, we helped make the voting rights come about in our own ways by having done all the other work that uh, had a groundswell so that uh, Lyndon Johnson and the Congress and uh, Washington passed it. What have Americans in general misunderstood about this particular act? I think M Americans then, uh, especially in the South, uh, maybe some Americans, let me put it that way, did quite n not quite understand why this uh, legislation came about. Uh, some of the ones who studied it are some of the ones who saw the inequities, the gross uh, negligence of justice, in, in some cases understood it. But uh, many in the South did not want to understand it. Uh, and as Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson has, has been said, that uh, we've lost the South for a generation because of that. Um, I think even today there's some misconception about why did we have affirmative action? Or why did we have it? Uh, everybody's an American and, and they're working, they pay their taxes, what are they griping about? Well, <laughs> you have to live it to really know what uh, it's about. And uh, it is about uh, being treated unequally. It is about uh, uh, not getting promotions in your work. It is about training uh, someone else uh, for the job you have and then getting demoted. And that uh, most of the time has been uh, uh, Anglos, the good old boy system. Um, and uh, people have to study the issue and look at the background, walk in my shoes and see what it's all about. How do you feel the younger generation, though, views um, advancements concerning uh, their race and heritage? Do you feel like, how do they feel, or how do you think they feel about these advancements that have been made over the years? Unfortunately, I don't think enough uh, young people realize some of the uh, uh, trials and tribulations that certain people in our country went through. Um, and I don't think enough of it is taught. It certainly is not taught in the public schools. Uh, for example, the history of uh, uh, many people today uh, would look at me or someone uh, of a little color and uh, name Gutierrez Barrientos Lara or what have you and think that, oh, you just walked across the border, didn't you? Uh, that's not the case. Uh, there, there's so much to learn, and I don't think enough uh, of our students, uh, especially Hispanic students, know the, the background, uh, where we come from, who we are, where we come from, and where we're going. Uh, a lot of the history is not being taught in our public schools, and we seem to be uh, walking backwards in a way, if you look at the Texas uh, uh, State Board of Education. 
how do you think though we can raise the awareness of to kind of reverse the walking backward instant that you mentioned <laughs> I, I don't want to turn this into a political uh, uh, situation but uh, I think that the general public in Texas has to learn the difference between uh, what being an American is and, and compromising and uh, not listening to the Tea Party or uh, extremists. Either way, left or right extremists, but recognize that we are indeed our brothers and sisters keepers and uh, we ought to act that way sometime. Okay, who were three people that um, you believe advanced the cause for political empowerment for Mexican Americans? Let's start at a national level, if you could think of three off the top of your head and kind of go down from there. Well, it would be difficult on a national level because we didn't have uh, too many uh, Hispanics, Mexican Americans uh, on the national level. Uh, it would have been uh, people like uh, Cesar Chavez, who I work with. Uh, and I'll tell you a little side story on that if you like uh, in a minute. But uh, I was one of the coordinators for the boycotts on lettuce and grapes for Cesar Chavez. Um, musicians have always held a special place for, uh, for Hispanics. Um, it may be anywhere from uh, Little Joe uh, y La Familia. It may uh, have been the, the uh, oh, there's so many musicians, so many wonderful people. Lidia Mendoza and, uh, and then, of course, icons like Pedro Infante or uh, so many others. Um, in Texas, Henry B. Gonzalez, Joe Bernal, Irma Rangel, uh, Alicia Chacon, um, see, one of the things that we should realize, if I may speak as a Mexican American, as a Tejano, is that we don't need to have one leader in our country for this group, or in Texas. There are many leaders, and uh, they come from all parts of Texas, and they're men and women uh, who are Hispanic Tejanos, uh, which reminds me, even today, uh, we, we kind of joke about uh, uh, here in Austin, uh, this street out here, Guadalupe, mm -hmm. or Manchac, uh, and not general public not realizing that Spanish has been on this land for nearly 500 years. Um, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> a little sidebar that when you're running for office and your name is Barrientos, uh, you are uh, thankful if they can, don't have to roll their R's, just say Barrientos is fine and vote right. So th there's still a lot to, uh, to, to go here. And of course, uh, there are those who think that we're trying to turn this into Mexico. We are not. This is our country. Uh, many of us and our families were here before the U.S. was uh, established here as Tejanos. At any rate, I got off the subject, so get me back on. <laughs> okay. I appreciate the stories. Why don't you tell me real quick about that side story, though, with Cesar Chavez that you had mentioned oh. real quick. Uh, Cesar Chavez asked me to come to, uh, to La Paz, California, where the uh, farm workers headquarters were. <coughs> and we were going to eat lunch. Very humble uh, dwelling there, and uh, a lady brought us two paper plates, and they placed a, a banana and an apple on the plates. And I'm thinking, uh, I guess we're going to have dessert first. Well, it turns out later, uh, Cesar Chavez was a vegetarian, a vegan, and uh, I always got a kick out of that being so. Uh, out of it. <laughs> uh, but he was such a sweet guy, gentle and powerful uh, and always dedicated. So you just discussed those who advanced political empowerment. Could you think of anyone either at a national, state level, or even local level in Austin that have maybe hindered uh, political empowerment for Mexican Americans? 
I will not get into speaking negatively about anything. Uh, that is to say, about uh, uh, Mexican Americans, unless it, it is an issue that is very, very clear. Because I think people want to do the right things, maybe uh, not for the right reasons, but uh, uh, I think that part of our problem, uh, like any other group, has been uh, nitpicking with each other. Um, I know, for example, I knew a lot of the folks who were in the Razonida party that was, uh, came up out of the uh, civil rights movement in Texas. And I worked with a lot of the folks who were there. And I helped the Razonida party in some places at some times. And uh, I remember when we won the primary in 74 for the Texas House, a couple of the Rasunida people asked me to, uh, to uh, change parties and run as a Rasunida party. And I said, you know, I would kind of like to do that, but uh, it's not realistic. Uh, Austin, Texas is not uh, Carrizo or Laredo or uh, some place that has a majority uh, of Hispanics there, Mexican-Americans. Uh, so I think we need to use more common sense in what we do. I know there are some uh, Mexican Americans, some Hispanics who are Republicans, and fine, as long as they have the information and uh, they base their their uh, desires on on facts. Okay, um, let's switch into your political affiliation and the political spectrum in regards to yourself and um, Mexican Americans. First off, where do you fall in line um, within the party system? I mean, philosophically? Uh, I mean, well, I know um, you're a Democrat, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess let's get into, I guess, the philosophic, uh, philosophically, where do you fall? This is me. Uh, I was always taught by my mom, dad, and the family about using common sense. It so happens that the Democratic Party has been there the most uh, for the most people on important issues. You have your Social Security, you have your Medicare, you have your GI Bill, you have uh, uh, all those issues that have been for the, the general public and especially helps uh, the less fortunate. In terms of, so that party has been mostly uh, with me, and that's why I've been with that party most. Um, now, in terms of political philosophy, to the right or to the left, I use common sense. Some people ask me, are you a, a liberal or are you conservative? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm liberal sometimes, and I'm conservative sometimes. I'm conservative about spending money, especially other people's money. Uh, I'm liberal when it comes to helping people and uh, making darn sure that uh, women's rights uh, are fully supported and that uh, voting rights are supported and education is supported equally for everybody. If you want to call that liberal, go ahead. I think it's common sense. Uh, so uh, I'm vehemently conservative and I'm vehemently liberal, depending on the issue. I like that perspective a lot. Um, has your party affiliation ever changed, though, over the years? Have you ever, has there ever been a moment in time <coughs> where you thought you fell in line more with the Republicans and the Democrats, or have you always been um, in line with the Democratic Party? Pretty much in line with the Democratic Party. Uh, there are some issues that uh, uh, Republicans have which, uh, uh, or common sense. Uh, you don't uh, spend money that you don't have. Um, and so there are a few times when, when I can yeah, kind of get along. Okay. Um, I did some research and it shows that m most uh, Mexican Americans fall in line with the Democratic Party. 
Do you believe that um, this is true, or do you think there's a greater divide between Mexican Americans who vote Democratic or who fall in line with the Republican Party? Oh, I absolutely think that the majority of uh, Mexican Americans, Tejanos, uh, fall in line with the with the uh, Democratic Party. Now, it's interesting to hear the pitch by the Republicans about, oh, Hispanics, Mexican Americans, Latinos, they're more uh, in line with us on family values and so forth and so on. Give me a break. It's common sense. What Everybody should have family values. <laughs> I agree. Um, what, I guess, accomplish accomplishments then have the Democratic Party um, promoted for Mexican Americans over the years? Well, I think going back to uh, desegregation, it was the Democratic Party going toward uh, um, those issues that cover everyone, not just uh, Mexican Americans, uh, uh, education. Uh, uh, college tuition uh, assistance, uh, bilingual education, uh, appointments of uh, women and minorities to certain boards and commissions in the state and supporting those from the city to the county to the state. Um, not enough, but heck, the last governor we had was, uh, uh, you know, people like Ann Richards or uh, uh, Mark White. Uh, uh, the appointments made now by the Republicans and the Republican governors have been, uh, maybe they have a Spanish surname, but uh, uh, they're there uh, in name only, if you get my drift. I do. Is there a political party that you feel like has hindered um, your community over the years? Or have there been certain occasions that? I think Repub I, I think the parties to some extent both because in the early days, the, the let's say in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and even to the 60s sometime, I was getting better, there were some Rep uh, Democrats uh, who were uh, a hindrance. And they, of course, became Republicans later. So then it was, of course, the, the Republicans uh, who have uh, hindered. In what ways? Maybe just give a quick example of um, one instance that they've hindered Mexican Americans. Their votes against bilingual education. Um, uh, the, the funding of uh, public schools, uh, especially in the rural areas. Um, the, the, the powerful lobbies that have been there on uh, uh, big money efforts uh, and the uh, legislative process. Okay. How does changing demographics change the political landscape for a community? Well, you can have all the changing demographics in the world. You can have the biggest population, but if they don't vote, ni pa qué. Uh, and I have gotten gray hair uh, for 50 years trying to get that done. We've made some progress, but uh, I'm conservative in this way. Um, government should help the people when it is needed. But by golly, it begins with that family, la familia. It begins with that mom and that dad. If that dad, for example, is not present, it's going to hurt the family and hurt us as uh, Tejanos and hurt us as Americans. Um, so the responsibility begins there. Um, oh, I could go on, but <laughs> do you <laughs> think? Do you think, though, you mentioned an interesting point about the aspect of people not voting. Do you think if Mexican Americans in particular would, you know, vote more or the younger generations would take a step and do that, do you think it would help the advancement of political empowerment or? This day, this state would change immensely 
and uh, I think that some of the uh, right wing uh, is a little afraid of that, and the right wing Anglo, shall I say, is a little afraid of that, thinking that if the Hispanics, Tejanos, get the majority and get all the power, they're going to treat us badly. No. <laughs> they're not going to do the same darn silly bigoted things that were cast upon us in the past. We want to be true Americans, that's all. Okay. Um, next we're going to move into an uh, aspect of coalition building for Mexican Americans. Um, let's just start with what issues led to coalition building um, back when you were, you know, working for maybe the Urban League and the Peace Corps. Um, let's just start from there and maybe build our way up. It's all about coalition building. Um, it's it's common sense. You 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 communicate. You uh, see what is in common and what is not, and work on those issues where there are commonalities and uh, agreements. Uh, politically, in business, or otherwise. Uh, the way we were elected in the first place was that we needed a coalition of uh, labor, AFL-CIO, of, uh, of liberals, of uh, uh, African Americans, Mexican Americans, uh, environmentalists, and that coalition uh, is what makes us progress. It certainly is not happening in Washington right now, but uh, it should. Could you describe the people of the coalitions or uh, maybe go back, maybe if they come from, do they come from different economic backgrounds? Do they come from um, different races, that sort of thing? Yeah, to bring it down to uh, uh, here locally in Austin, uh, like I said, we put these coalitions together. Labor, AFL-CIO, have always been for the working uh, man and woman. and. Uh, they have commonalities with, uh, with African Americans, with uh, Mexican Americans. Um, we have uh, the environmentalist. Uh, if you think of anybody who has some common sense, we want to leave this earth the same, or close to the same way that God gave it to us in the first place. Um, youth, students. Uh, we put that together uh, because so often uh, the youth and the students are left out of the picture. You're, you're too young to know anything. So, um, In talking about coalitions, I was asked by the City Council to sit on the Charter Review Committee and as chairman of that we pushed through um, having districts for the City of Austin and so the students were very much involved in that. Well, everybody agreed to it, uh, pretty much. The Republicans, Democrats, neighborhood associations, uh, environmentalists, uh, minorities, NAACP, LULAC, et cetera. So that's what coalition does. It builds and builds for the better of the community. Okay. Um, are there any external constraints sometime that hinder coalition building? Well, yeah, there are intentional um, spins put out there by the people that don't want uh, coalitions to be built. Um, and it's usually put out there by extreme right folks. How does um, the differences in class for Mexican Americans, um, I guess, do they help or hurt advocating for political empowerment and political rights? Well, if you're talking about class as an economic class, um, you have a, a large percentage of Mexican Americans in low income. A good number uh, in the last 20 years or so, 30 years, in middle class, and very few in the high economic range. Um, 
I, I, I think that I would concentrate vote-wise on the low income and the middle class. Not leave the high income out totally, but you're going to find uh, a, a good number of those individuals uh, having become Republican, or in some cases forgetting where they come from and uh, not being considered, not considering themselves as Hispanic or Tejanos. Okay. Um, next, we're just going to finish up with a couple finding closal, closing thoughts and uh, questions that I have. Um, this one I thought was interesting just because you bring in a lot of different races can represent. I mean, you represent people. You try not to particularly advocate for a particular race, but can someone of a different race represent Mexican Americans? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that individual has to know the community. I, I cite you, uh, my good friend Elliot uh, from, from El Paso, mm -hmm. Shapley, uh, knows the community, uh, is totally bilingual, and has a good heart and is a good fighter. And uh, uh, that can be done, regardless of color. Men or women. Matter of fact, I think we ought to have a woman governor in Texas this coming year. Do you think it's going to happen? It's going to be really hard. Really hard. But I think it can be done. Uh, and I think women should lead the charge. And I'm going to follow them. I like that. Um, just another question. What are your perception of other um, minorities Let's just, let's say African Americans, what obstacles do they face? Are they similar to the obstacles that Mexican Americans have overcome or still need to overcome, or are they different? I think they're very similar. Um, I think that uh, Mexican Americans have gone through many of the very same things that African Americans have in this country. Uh, you can go back all the way back in, in history on how the Texas Rangers were just lynching uh, uh, people uh, here in Texas and uh, uh, our segregated schools. I went there. Um, and I think we still have much to do. And so I think there are natural coalitions that occur like that. Um, but uh, many similarities. Okay. How do you feel about being a role model since you've been in a position of power for 21 years and beyond that? People respect you and honor you. So how do you feel about being that person? Well, I don't know if I'm a role model, but uh, I hope that somebody can learn a few things from me. Uh, we must realize that no man or woman walks on water. Uh, everybody makes mistakes, so there's no perfection. Um, I, I just try to show direction to uh, especially kids, young people. Okay. And then um, let me backtrack for one second. I apologize. Um, how things have changed, how have things changed after the Voting Rights Act in terms of um, Mexican-American rights or rights for any minority that experienced? We have made uh, some great gains. We have gotten certain people elected. Um, but at this point in time, we're standing still or going backwards, not of our own volition, but uh, the people who are opposed to us, the fringe groups on the right the Tea Parties, uh, the, the people who are still bigoted and racist. Uh, they're out there. And uh, it's like uh, uh, Jefferson said, that is to say that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Okay. And then lastly, um, what do you want people to remember you for? Hmm. Uh, a person who tried 
and uh, got a few things accomplished. A few things accomplished, and uh, we try to teach from experience. Okay. I'd like to be remembered as Emma's husband. Seems very nice. Now, is there anything else I might have missed today that you would like to bring in um, as we're closing up this interview? Oh, there's so many things to talk about. Maybe we can have a second <laughs> session sometime. <laughs> but no other final thoughts for today? Um, let's try to reach the American dream together. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Gonzalo. I really appreciate you taking the time. Okay, um, just describe for me how this lawsuit, the, the, the lawsuit in Bastrop affected your education. Do you, what, I guess let's start with what would have happened if the lawsuit was never passed? God only knows, but I can only tell you that I probably would not have, uh, gone further than two or three grades in school and like most other uh, Hispanics gone out as a teenager to work and, and help the family be it picking cotton or driving a truck or what have you. Um, I would like to think that I would be on my own reading all kind of books and becoming a, a learned uh, uh, leader, but uh, uh, the odds are uh, would be against us in that kind of a situation, and uh, that's why <laughs> uh, I think that we ought to to honor uh, that civil rights lawyer Gustavo Garcia from San Antonio and uh, several other people who helped him, including uh, Bob Eckhart, who uh, later became a congressman and whose daughter is today running for county judge in Travis County, Sarah Eckhart. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that those individuals, those leaders, uh, didn't realize the full impact of their work because uh, it affected millions of children. How... Um I guess describe a typical school day for you before the lawsuit was passed. Was I mean, what were the differences between when it was still um, segregated? Well, fortunately, I uh, I only uh, experienced one year of segregation. But all I can remember is a couple of things. One, the teacher would give us a sheet of paper, blank sheet of paper and a crayon. Knock yourself out. That was it. The other thing I remember is that, well, two other things. One, uh, somebody stole a cousin of mine's lunch. We had a little brown bag. And the teacher sat us all out in front of the back of the school on the ground and she would look at all of us and see who would crack about who had stole, who'd stolen the lunch. And nobody cracked. So we walk back into the classroom and she has a ruler and you'd put out your hand and she'd whack every one of us when we went in there. The other thing I remember <laughs> is after a rainy day, being out on the swings, and this, I was six years old, and there was wa water under the the, the swing and I just splashed in there and the older girls came to drive me off uh, in front of the uh, uh, stove that was over there. Uh, pretty good memories. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Describe um, the two filibusters that you were involved in when you were serving in office. Well, first of all, filibusters are not all they're cracked up to be. Um, it's rough. Uh, you got to stand there. You can't lean on your desk. Uh, you can't sit. Uh, you can't uh, eat. And of course, you can't go to the bathroom. Um, and then you have to talk. 
continuously and stay on the subject. And uh, after about 10 hours of that, he started getting a little tired and woozy. Uh, the filibuster in Texas anyway is used as w part of the process in the rules on you want to get something accomplished to put pressure on the rest of the uh, Senate. Uh, for example, uh, when the airport was being closed, the old Miller Airport was being closed, there was a vote by the citizens of Austin to move it to Bergstrom, where it is now. Some of the senators wanted to leave it there uh, so that they could come into downtown real quick. And I said, no, my constituents have voted to move it. And if that's what you're going to do, we're going to filibuster. So they backed off and they had the airport moved over there. In the filibusters that I actually did, it had to do with protection of the Barton Springs and the Edwards Aquifer. Uh, legislation was pending that would harm the environment and especially Barton Springs and the Edwards Aquifer. So uh, in one case for 18 hours I filibustered and in another case uh, for 21 hours I filibustered and uh, killed a few of their bills and made them realize that we must protect the environment. What did it, how did it feel when you received a standing ovation for um, filibustering for that long of a period of time? Were you relieved? Uh, standing ovation, I'm telling you, by after 21 hours of standing and talking, you don't remember much else. You just want to hit the sack and uh, sleep for 10 or 20 hours, well, 10, 10 or 12. Uh, but uh, I'm glad somebody appreciated it because uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, and I know that in, in telling Wendy Davis about filibustering, I said, Wendy, you can do it, uh, but it'll be kind of tough after about 10 hours. Was that one of the hardest things you ever did as well in office? Nah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just curious. I was in good shape. Uh, I don't know if I could do 21 hours now, but uh, it was worth it. Okay. And then just describe for me very... Lastly, um, the Quorum in Albuquerque. Oh, there were some uh, issues that were going to be taken up. Um, what was at stake for the two filibusters? The uh, filibusters was protection of the Edwards Aquifer and the uh, Barton Springs swimming area. What would have happened if the filibuster wouldn't have gone through? What would have, what would, would have been the result of that? Well, there was leg legislation pending for uh, building over the Edwards Aquifer and uh, uh, pollution, eventually, of the water and uh, messing up Barton Springs and all the swimming beauty we have out there. Okay, and now describe the quorum that took place in Albuquerque. There was an effort being made uh, which would have hurt Democrats and uh, the people of Texas in our estimation, uh, redistricting. And the only uh, avenue we had left to fight against it was to break the quorum. And so 11 of us took off to Albuquerque, New Mexico to take a stand over there. And uh, we spent six weeks there. One of the senators broke and uh, that broke our quorum. One of the senators uh, from Houston and uh, we had to come back because that we needed that 11th person. Uh, so it was the Albuquerque t 11 minus 1. What year was that? Oh, 
I mean, uh, 2003, perhaps. Okay. So you, just to get this right, to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, so you went to Albuquerque, and then because the one um, person from Houston had to leave, you were not able to finish your... We got beat. For example, you have in Travis County five congressmen. They just tore the hell out of Travis County which I think is unfair and we got to keep fighting. Okay. Thank you again. Yes. <laughs>